the most extraordinary mathematician of the 20th century, was born to working-class parents and had early on a very modest education. Yet by the age of 11, when he encountered formal maths in school for the first time, it was already clear that Srinivasa Ramanujan was operating on a different plane. In his early teens, he tutored other pupils, mastered new concepts with ease, and won a string of academic awards. In 1903, as a 16-year-old, he got hold of a library copy of a book with the disarmingly simple title, A Synopsis of Elementary Results, which, in fact, was a dense collection of about 5,000 results in pure maths based on the notoriously challenging mathematical tripos at Cambridge. Not satisfied merely to absorb the book's contents, Ramanujan set out to derive all of its results himself with no outside help. In the process he came up with a wealth of other extraordinary conclusions that seemed to spring from nowhere. This almost manic creativity with no obvious point of origin became a hallmark of Ramanujan's work. To the end of his life he attributed all of his major insights and discoveries to a singular source beyond logic the goddess of Namajira, his hometown, who, he said, appeared to him in visions and revealed formulae, which, upon waking, he'd seek to verify. Ramanujan's proofs, however, were often incomplete, making it hard to check them, or sometimes even to make sense of his propositions. They were also sometimes just plain wrong. It's possible that Ramanujan would have remained in relative obscurity had he not in his twenties written a series of letters to distinguished British mathematicians. Only one of them took him seriously. Fortunately, that one happened to be G. H. Hardy, famed Cambridge scholar and distinguished number theorist who had himself been precocious as a child. While still a toddler, Hardy wrote down numbers into the millions, and later, when taken to church on the Sabbath, he'd passed the time factorizing the numbers of hymns. In Ramanujan's writings, Hardy recognized something very special indeed. Some of the Indians' results corresponded to known maths, but of a very advanced nature, and arrived at by unfamiliar means. Other results seemed utterly new, but, in Hardy's opinion, probably true, because if they were not, he said, no one would have the imagination to invent them. In Romanujan's obituary, which sadly Hardy would pen just seven years later, he wrote that Romanujan was a mathematician of the highest quality, a man of altogether exceptional originality and power. On his personal scale of maths ability, Hardy scored himself a modest 25. Another close colleague at Cambridge, John Littlewood, 30, and David Hilbert, the most renowned mathematician of the time, 80. Ramanujan he rated at 100. Hardy invited Ramanujan to join him at Cambridge and for a few years the two formed a formidable team. Hardy taught the younger man how to set down proofs, in an orthodox way so that they could be published in academic journals and checked by other mathematicians. At the same time he was aware that it was neither possible nor desirable to give the Indian a conventional education in all the areas of maths that he'd missed. Hardy understood well the danger of such an education, that it can stifle the kind of extreme creativity that's so often the sign and greatest product of true genius. Knowing too much about a subject can make us overly cautious. Having a lot of conventional wisdom may make us doubt our own hunches and intuition because we're more likely to think that any seemingly good ideas that pop into our heads are wrong if they don't square with what we've previously learned. Had Ramanujan received an expensive but traditional education, would his genius have burned so brightly and uniquely? For sure, mathematical genius needs some foundation on which to build, but what's the optimal amount of formal schooling to nurture genius but not at the same time crush it with conformity? <laughs>